Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's NAC at Home program. My name is Mitch Case, and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and much more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're interested in becoming a member of the National Arts Club or would like more information, please email admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to share a message from Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Club's Archaeology Committee. Thank you, Mitch, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee of the National Arts Club, and delighted to welcome today's international audience to a fascinating program about America's past. Yearly, our committee enjoins treating the rich history of the United States, which contributes in turn to a fuller understanding of our nation while providing a global perspective. Today, Dr. James Preston Delgado discusses the infamous December 7th, 1941 attack with his lecture entitled, 80 Years Ago, Pearl Harbor's Archaeological Legacy. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Delgado. He previously lectured about Kubla Khan's lost fleet, which inspired an article you might be able to locate within the Huffington Post archives, as well as ironclads, blockade runners, and submarines, nautical archaeological perspectives on the Civil War. A measure of the scholar is that on the day following his club's presentation, albeit probably exhausted, he visited Washington Irving High School to engage with their students enrolled in our educational initiative. World-renowned nautical archeologist serving on the editorial advisory board of Archaeology Magazine, former director of the Maritime Heritage Program for the National Oceanic Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries for the last five, six years, Senior Vice President of Search Inc., the largest private cultural resources firm in the US, as well as television host for National Geographic's The Sea Hunters during the 2001 to 2006 season with whose staff he is currently collaborating on Drain the Oceans. Jim has also written approximately 40 volumes. I'm astonished how he ever found the time. His ongoing archaeological research is focused upon the quote, Tilda, the last known US ship to transport African captives a half century after Congress been the slave trade, unbelievable, which arrived in Alabama in July of 1860 and has been featured in National Geographic magazine and recently on 60 Minutes. On a more personal note, I recall telephoning Jim Delgado many years ago from the Mystic Seaport Museum about something I had just learned and his replying, Michelle, can we continue this conversation tomorrow? As it turned out, scant minutes before, Jim had landed at an airport fresh from his latest discovery. Could it have been related to Bermuda? Another connection occurred with the Society for Historical Archaeology Conference held in Washington. On January 7th, 2021, I was an online presenter discussing remote archaeology lectures at the National Arts Club. But it was the preceding day of January 6, which proved unforgettable. That's when the treasonous attack on Congress occurred. On the same evening, the 6th of January, James Delgado received SHA's prestigious James Deeds Book Award for War at Sea, A Shipwrecked History 
published by Oxford University Press with a paperback edition soon to be released. A partial response to the date times heinous events is to follow Jim's lead. He repeatedly connects the work of archeologists with the public by affirming our common humanity and respect for the other, something he is passionate about sharing, a most significant lesson the discipline of archeology span affords. Join me in welcoming Dr. James P. Delgado. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to once again engage with an audience through the magic of this institution. 80 years ago yesterday, we marked, I should say, we as the United States suffered a tremendous and terrible attack which propelled America into the Second World War. That attack, a surprise to many, had been carefully planned for over a year by Japan. And when executed, coincided with attacks in Malaya, Singapore, and of course in the Philippines where the United States also had troops. The Pearl Harbor attack was one of those moments in world history that is remembered for generations that follow because of the impact not only of the event itself, but of the lasting changes that have occurred in the world as a consequence of the actions that come with events like this. For the United States, this was a moment at which having stayed away from war, it was now propelled into an already global conflict a conflict that the United States with its allies would carry through to ultimate success as had been promised by the president of the United States in his war message to Congress in the aftermath of the attack. The world changed as a result of World War II, and we live today in different circumstances, not only than those that the generation previous had experienced, but indeed circumstances very different had the forces of the Axis powers under Germany, Italy, and Japan succeeded in their plans for global conquest. The attack at Pearl Harbor was focused on that specific base on the island of Oahu, which for close to four decades had been an active US naval facility, but only recently had become the central point for the United States to project naval power throughout the Pacific. Pearl Harbor, a natural anchorage that had previously been fished and hunted by the native Hawaiian community, had become a vast industrial yard. And at the time of the attack, not only featured shipbuilding and ship repair facilities, a massive tank farm for fueling the fleet, but also the moorage place, both along Ford Island, which had been graded and turned into a large airstrip, but also vessels moored separate from the island in and around, making this vast protected fleet anchorage an obvious spot for an enemy attack. Pearl Harbor, as I said, had been selected and was the site for this vast naval base, but it was protected by army forts, some seacoast fortifications, and army airfields, which ringed Oahu. In many ways, the battle that would follow, well known as Pearl Harbor, more properly in modern terms, would perhaps better be known as the Battle of Oahu. But that being said, Pearl Harbor was the central point and the focus, and that name resonates through history to this day. The architect of the attack was Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, no stranger to the United States, formal naval attache, an educated man. Yamamoto had come to form strong friendships with a number of his American colleagues, admired the United States, but also knew that the path his country was taking was ultimately going to propel the two countries toward war. He offered no allusions to his, uh, his uh, senior leadership or to the prime minister or the emperor when asked how this war could proceed. He said that he could basically run amok for approximately six months, but after that, it was anyone's guess. 
following in the Japanese tradition of a strategic uh, surprise attack, uh, Yamamoto proposed using aircraft to take out the United States Pacific Fleet. Japanese naval planning previously had called for a massive at-sea battle between two opposing fleets in the great tradition of naval warfare, particularly as seen in the British Navy's defeat of Napoleon's forces along with Spain's at the Battle of Trafalgar or subsequent naval battles elsewhere. But with this, what Yamamoto was gambling on was a very strong tactical strike that strategically might take the United States out of the war for a long enough period of time with its fleet devastated, if not completely sunk, by which time Japan could have taken over much of the Pacific and added it to its greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. The plan was daunting to say the least, but he turned it over to a group of talented officers, including Minoru Genda and Mitsuo Fushida, who were part of, uh, of intensive planning as well as training and preparations. By the time the Japanese had completed their training, they sortied from Hitakapu Bay at the end of November of 1941 and under strict radio silence and without using radar, made their way across the North Pacific to finally reach their position for the assault with six carriers, Kaga, Akagi, Hiryu, Soryu, Shokaku, and Zuikaku, supported by a fleet of vessels that surrounded them to help protect and screen them should the carriers encounter the United States Navy. The pilots trained and prepared for what would be at least two waves or sorties by the pilots that would fly off of the, the aircraft carriers in a mix of fighters, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and high altitude bombers. Reaching their position on the morning of December 7th, Hawaii time, they launched in the pre-dawn hours and made their way across some 230 miles of open ocean to approach Oahu and to come in over the mountains to strike Pearl Harbor. It was to be a surprise attack. What they hadn't counted on was the fact that the United States had installed and was testing radar. And on that morning, a couple of the more keen guys training in that, uh, Lockhart and Elliott, decided to just stay a little bit longer. And they picked up a blip, which when they phoned their lieutenant, were told not, not to worry about it. It was likely a group of aircraft coming in that had been destined to arrive from the mainland. With that, they simply switched the equipment off, made their way back down for breakfast, and then realized as they approached Pearl Harbor with the smoke rising, that what they had seen had been the attacking force. This was one of a few missed opportunities perhaps in advance of the assault. The Japanese waves as they approached the island split. First wave came in with 183 planes followed by a second wave of 171 planes. They moved around the island and began to systematically attack those areas that would rise to the defense of Pearl Harbor. They attacked Hickam Field, Kaneohe, Bellows Field, Ewa, Mooring Mass Field. And with that, struck hard at aircraft on the ground. Only a handful of pilots on the American side would be able to get up out and, and into the air to confront these hundreds of Japanese aircraft. At Kaneohe in particular, they took out the seaplane base, which had been flying patrols in and around Pearl Harbor and guarding its sea approaches. And then they would hit Pearl Harbor. Kaneohe's strike was particularly devastating. Many of the aircraft were moored on the water or pulled up onto the ramps. They were struck repeatedly. And as Kaneohe went up in flames on that day, the first individual to win the Medal of Honor in World War II achieved that status by fighting back. Chief John Finn, driving out in his new car, and later telling a number of us in an interview how mad he was when he got there, not only because of the attack, but because the Japanese pilot had strafed and damaged his new car, manned a machine gun that he took away from a painter who had grabbed it and started to fight back Finn, figuring he could fire better than a painter. And so it was that he stayed at that post for over two hours, firing at Japanese aircraft and taking hits. By the time the battle was over, Finn had been credited with damaging and likely downing more than one aircraft 
and had received 21 wounds. For this, John Finn would receive the Medal of Honor and he remained with us. And a number of folks like myself were able to meet and interview Chief Finn uh, in the years that followed. He died at age 100, at that stage, the oldest Medal of Honor winner. Others who got up and fought included two army pilots. These guys had just finished an all night poker game, had just gone to bed when uh, they heard the noise and came on out to find that the Japanese were attacking their field. With that, uh, these two, two pilots, Kenneth Taylor, excuse me, just a second. <clears throat> Sorry, these two pilots were able to get up into the air in their Army P-40s, only a handful of craft that were able to do this and engage the Japanese. For those of you who have watched more recent movies, including the epic Pearl Harbor film starring Ben Affleck, uh, you get a sense of the exploits of those days and the character that Affleck plays uh, along with Josh Harnett are loosely modeled on, uh, on these two pilots. These activities, these brave moments of fighting back were echoed by others on the ground and on the ships as they broke open ammunition lockers, as they quickly sprang to action. In some cases, finding that firing pins were not in place, not all ammunition was there, but just the same with anything and everything they had, they began to fight back as the waves of aircraft approached. At Pearl Harbor, Colors were just being raised. Men were coming to breakfast on a quiet Sunday morning. When the first aircraft approached, men scrambled as planes began to strafe the decks of their ships and as the bombs began to fall. The Japanese plan included not only aerial assault and strafing, but also using torpedoes to sink U.S. ships at Battleship Row. Their targets were not only the battle cruisers, the, the battleships, but also the aircraft carriers that they hoped would be there as part of this strategic knockout blow. The carriers were not there as Commander Michuo Fushida um, and his team flew over. Fushida fired a flare gun to signal begin attack. And with that, the pilots began to dive down, including the torpedo bombers who skimmed low over the water, flying no higher than maybe 40, 50 feet above it to launch their torpedoes at the last moment. Pearl Harbor is notoriously shallow at 45 feet it was too shallow to successfully launch torpedoes because ordinarily these things would drop on down about 100 feet and then right and come in to strike the target. The Japanese had trained and had modified their torpedoes by cleverly fitting wooden fins to help level them out. And this was the key to success. And this captured Japanese photograph from the war. You actually see one of the torpedo planes coming up as it has just finished its, its approach and dropped its torpedo and climbed straight up. And you can see the plumes as torpedoes erupt and send geysers of water up along the sides of the battleships. In interviewing the commander of the torpedo force, and perhaps even in the man in this plane that we see in the photograph, he said that after all of this training, he still didn't know if it would work. But as they skimmed across the water and as he pulled the handle and the torpedo hit the water, he followed it along and then pulled up sharply, basically climbed right up the side of the battleship. And at that moment, looked to see an American sailor lock eyes with him in shock and surprise. And at that moment, then the torpedo went off. He said the plane bucked and kicked, but he climbed into the sky and with his microphone triggered it and gave the code word for successful torpedo attack, Tsu, Tsu, Tsu. Meanwhile, above Pearl Harbor, Mitsuo Fushida had also sent a radio message which broadcast in the clear all the way back to Japan with the code for successful attack commenced, Tora, Tora, Tora. From high above Pearl Harbor, as dive bombers plummeted down and dropped their bombs along ships as well as on the land, a number of crack bombardiers had trained with heavily modified 1,760-pound shells from the battleship Nagato which had been turned into aerial bombs. These were ship killers. And with that, these bombardiers lining up with specific targets that each had selected began to drop their bombs. Noburo Kanai, one of the crack bombardiers from the carrier Kaga, 
was one of those, and his target was USS Arizona. Not all of these heavy bombs hit. Indeed, the painting that you see here by Tom Freeman shows huge splashes as some of these go into the water and erupt in proximity to Arizona, the ship USS Vestal next to it, and the battleship Nevada behind it. But ultimately, one of those did strike. And at that moment, that shell punched through the deck forward close to the number two turret of Arizona and went off deep inside in the ready magazine as well as in a nearby powder magazine for the charges that helped kick or launch planes off of the, uh, the aircraft crane on the aft end of Arizona. In that moment, Arizona and most of her crew died. In a massive explosion that saw close to a million pounds of powder deflagrate like a huge Roman candle with ex impressive explosive force, uh, a shockwave moved out across the water as Arizona's sides buckled and pushed out, as the forward portion of the deck collapsed into a pit of basically molten steel, and pieces of the ship as well as the remains of crew rained onto Fort Island and in the surrounding water in an area encompassing more than a mile. That explosion was captured on film, and at that moment, for anyone and everyone who saw it at Pearl Harbor, it was as if time had stopped. It was such a stunning and powerful and terrible sight that it remained seared in the memory, not only of those that were there, but ultimately that image of the destroyed, burning Arizona, which would continue to burn for 48 hours, became a national symbol of the day of infamy. 1,177 men died at that moment. Others survived, some of them grievously wounded. One of the Survivors, Donald Stratton, who a number of us had the honor to meet and interview before his passing not too long ago, told me of being in his compartment the, with a shipmate as they were at their battle stations. They could hear a heavy pounding, almost like a rain, which was the Japanese bullet striking the deck. And then over the loudspeaker, this is no drill with an expletive ants added, which in the peacetime Navy would have gotten that sailor into a great deal of trouble. And that's what convinced Stratton that this was no drill. With that suddenly came a massive heaving explosion, which knocked both men to the deck. And when they got up, the walls of their steel compartment were beginning to glow from red to white hot. With that, his shipmate looked down at his bare arms as Don looked at his, they could see their skin beginning to wrinkle and the hairs on their arms beginning to smoke. They were both wearing shorts, boots, t-shirts, and their Navy caps. It was a, a casual Sunday, if we will. And if they'd stayed, they would have baked alive. Stratton's shipmate went over to the, the hatch, grabbed its steel dogs with his bare hands and screamed as they basically melted onto that hatch. As he pushed it open, his hands came off at his wrists he burst into a ball of flame and disappeared. And Don Stratton pulled his t-shirt up over his head, ran out through the flames. And as he felt the heat take his skin, he tumbled over the side and into the cool waters of Pearl Harbor. Stratton would take over a year to recover with massive, a number, with, a, with massive wounds and many surgeries. And throughout his life, Don Stratton continued to have surgery on those scars. But he also returned to fight another example of that great generation and of not only resolve or American stubbornness, but also something that marked those both physically as well as emotionally, the need to get up and fight again. The news of the Pearl Harbor attack stunned the country in a way that subsequent generations might not have understood unless 9-11 had happened. And with that, those not born then, those who did not remember that Sunday morning interrupted by the broadcast, had a sense of what that had felt like for the previous generation. Congress declared war after President Roosevelt appeared before them. And in noting this date of infamy, he closed his remarks with not only reminding the country that we would never forget this, but that we would also ultimately and inevitably triumph over these forces of evil. Congress declared war on Japan, 
Germany joined Japan in declaring war on the United States. And with that, America entered a global war that it had previously stayed out of. With that, a longstanding American desire after World War I to remain neutral in global conflicts went away and the United States assumed a new role that it continues to this day as a major force in global politics, as well as a defender of democracy. In the aftermath of the attack, which claimed 2,403 American lives, wounded 1,178, at a cost of 129 dead Japanese airmen and submarine crew, and with six ships basically sunk and hundreds of aircraft destroyed, uh, the Japanese had lost five small midget submarines and 29 planes. Putting the fires out and rescuing those trapped in overturned battleships occupied the initial attention, but with that, and as well recovering and learning as best we could from the Japanese aircraft that had been shot down, the United States Navy and the country moved on to clearing Pearl Harbor of its wreckage and salvaging what it could from the damaged battleships, as well as putting ships back into fighting condition. Diving inside the wreck took place to recover that which could be found, including a number of bodies, particularly in Arizona, which had sunk so rapidly that its forward compartments had completely flooded without much damage, but it trapped many of the men inside who'd never had a chance. In other cases, men had been trapped in rapidly rising water and were able to be rescued, though there were other occasions where, as the, hatch, as the hull was cut, uh, the pressure that had kept the water down was released, and before those men could be pulled free, they drowned. But with, again, tremendous resolve and pushing forward, Pearl Harbor was ultimately cleared of its wreckage, save two ships that could not be pulled free, Arizona and USS Utah, and a number of vessels were put back into service to fight again. And in short order, the United States was firmly and fully committed, not only to the war in the Pacific, but also the war in the Atlantic. The carriers had fortunately escaped because they had not been there during the attack. And so the United States had a bit of a leg up in that. The Japanese had thought about a third strike, but Admiral Chichi Nagumo in charge of the operation felt that he'd risked too much already and retreated even though his officers had begged him to go back for a third hit. And as well in that occasion to take out the tank farms with all of the fuel for the Navy, as well as some of the dry dock and repair facilities. Nagumo's decision not to do that would ultimately prove to be one of a series of fatal mistakes by the Japanese. With Arizona in particular, one of the ships that could not be salvaged, some of its guns were raised, refurbished along with guns from other battleships. They were emplaced above Oahu in concrete batteries that took those turrets and those guns and aimed them out to sea to help defend should the Japanese come back. A second planned attack never did happen, although submarine warfare did take place. Arizona would remain a powerful and potent symbol, scarred, some of its superstructure cut away, and finally, in 1960, become the centerpiece of a new and powerful memorial that was ultimately built to straddle the Hulk, to memorialize this sunken grave, this icon of the day of infamy. And to this day, it remains perhaps the central focus of all that happens at Pearl Harbor in memory of that day. The National Park Service, with whom I worked back in those days, had a submerged resources unit which dealt with underwater archaeology. And when the Arizona Memorial was tasked to the National Park Service by the U.S. Navy, to both help manage, but also to lead tours to, plan evolved into not only better understanding Arizona as a shipwreck, but also to learn more about what was happening to it and how long it might survive, and as well to try to determine the source of the oil that continued to leak from it. As part of the team that worked there in the 1980s, it was an amazing opportunity, not only to meet the various veterans and to talk with them and to hear their stories, 
but to also dive on Arizona, which is a very rare opportunity. The ship is a tomb and most cannot do this. Uh, these images show how we did all of that work back then in an effort led by Daniel Lenhan and Larry Murphy at the National Park Service. And by hand, the wreck was carefully mapped and documented, discovering a variety of things that included dishes and silverware left over from a breakfast forever interrupted, the muzzles of the forward turrets, three um, guns still in place, sitting in the midst of a volcanic crater that had been formed by the blast, and fire hoses that lay not tangled, but in positions that we ultimately figured out had been where firefighters on the crew, while Arizona was burning, but had not yet received its fatal hit, had stood working to save their ship and their shipmates when that final blast came, and those men literally disappeared in the fireball, leaving only those hoses to mark not only their service, but their sacrifice. This initial step into the archaeology of Pearl Harbor, of course, focused on documentation, but also key to all of this was an understanding that we needed to share this story. That story was being powerfully told in a variety of other means, but the physical reality and the survival of Arizona and as much of Arizona that still spoke to that moment of December 7, 1941, was something that needed to be conveyed. These drawings were converted into a large scale model of the wreck of Arizona that you can still see at the visitor center there. But what also uh, occurred was the sharing of images, the variety of films that began to emerge and the telling of more stories. At the same time, what also happened was the realization for all of us of how Arizona, not only because of the memorial, but because it could be visited as the memorial had touched not only the generation that had lived through those events, but also those who from far away had never heard again from a, a husband, a son, a father, an uncle, who now came in the years following the war and with the memorial there to pay their respects. We've recovered a large number of things off of the, the sunken deck of Arizona directly above, below the memorial. That included sunglasses, uh, camera lenses, cameras themselves, coins that some had dropped, but also from time to time fading photographs and notes that had been dropped by family members. And when you down there, just in several feet of water, would come across one of these photographs and hold it and see it fading in the seawater, but just the same, see a woman with white hair surrounded by grown men and women and small children you realize that this was a Pearl Harbor widow coming back to visit her dead husband and to share with him some sense in a grave that he would never be recovered from of the family and of the life that had gone on after his passing and after his loss and his sacrifice at Pearl Harbor. Those kinds of moments were powerful and profound and, and I know they touched all of us, particularly as the decision was made to working with the Navy, begin to inter survivors who wish to be back with their shipmates for eternity. The murkiness of Pearl Harbor is such that you can't see all of the battleship at one time. Much of the work that we did was literally hand by hand moving through the mark and through the work of scientific illustrators and archaeologists Larry Nordby and Jerry Livingston, the drawings were done. But it would ultimately take a different type of technology to share what we had seen. At the same time, what we saw, which was changing, also was a reminder that in certain places on Arizona, time remained still. This is a, a port, a dog, uh, it, it's been dogged shut, it's blast covers in place, the glass is unbroken. And what you see there through the corrosion in the glass is the fact that this is only half flooded with water and oil and that the air that is still in there and trapped is the air of that morning of December 7th, 19. We never ventured inside Arizona personally because it was not only a tomb as we initially thought, but also it was a very hazardous place to enter and to dive in, particularly given the, uh, the realization that the ship was corroding. That being said, 
the Navy had dewatered those areas after divers had removed the bodies they could find and had gone in there in places like this, you know, uh, space to recover ammunition and powder as best they could. And then the pumps were turned off and Arizona flooded again. In recent years, particularly working with colleagues like Evan Kovacs, uh, they've been able to go inside using small robots that have been designed to go where one cannot go and to safely enter. Uh, Evan's system actually unspools the reel as it moves through so that you don't have a long line to tangle. And here, what you're seeing are the interior spaces of Arizona's uh, aft compartments, deck by deck. Mud fills a number of the lower spaces, but in other places you can still see things sitting there as they were, including lockers and spaces like this, where a jacket still hangs in that closet covered in rust and oil. Again, a reminder that for all of that destruction on that day, and with all that sank Arizona, things survived. Sharing this has also taken new dimensions with extensive laser mapping of Arizona to create detailed, not just the depictions, if we will, but also the type of data that can be measured to gain a sense of just what's happening to the ship and how it's changing over time. Here, what you see is in blue, the outline of the number two turret with its guns removed as they were taken out to be repurposed. But the number one turret sunk down and fallen, its muzzles pointing down because the trunnions of those guns were broken. In the midst of that, as I described it, volcanic maw, that crater formed by the blast, and forward of that, all of that green you see is decking in the sides of Arizona that blew up and out at a moment, which not only dug this area out of the ship and sent a shockwave through the entire vessel, as well as a fireball, but which also nearly broke the bow off of the battleship. And yet again, things survive. And as they have survived, the latest work has also involved detailed scanning, not to recover these things that still lie down there, but scanning things from the galley, for example, like this pot, and then being able to digitally three-dimensionally print them for museum display and for interpretive programs. The Park Service has also done live tours of the wreck with archeologists from the Submerged Resources Center and park staff moving through and giving visitors a sense that previously we'd not been able to do. And this has been powerfully done in particular for the various uh, anniversaries. The other battleship that the team studied was USS Utah, another veteran of the World War I era. This one, not a battleship anymore, but converted into a, a platform for testing anti-aircraft guns and for practice. It had been hit by Japanese bombers, uh, it torpedoed it, it started to capsize. 58 men died, more might have, but Chief Watertender Peter Tomich went down below and tried to counter flood and save his shipmates. Nevada did not, excuse me, Utah did not completely capsize. Peter Tomich did not make it out. He's a Congressional Medal of Honor winner and he remains entombed inside the ship. Nevada could also not be salvaged. It kept slipping in the mud as they tried to raise it. And so it remains on the opposite side of Ford Island, opposite Arizona. The work that we did in the 80s has been followed through in later years. Uh, some of the ship sticks above the water, but that which remains below after initially being hand mapped and drawn by Jerry uh, Livingston and Larry Nordby has now subsequently been documented not only with photographs, but also with high definition sonar that gives you a sense of Utah as it sits in the mud of Pearl Harbor. Lesser known, it remains also significant and important. And along with Arizona are two of only nine ships or shipwrecks, I should say, in the United States that have received the highest honor of recognition in historic preservation as national historic landmarks. With that, not only a sense of the ships as wrecks, but also their long careers and their service are also noted and commemorated. Subsequent work has expanded the archeological understanding of Pearl Harbor. Our colleagues at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, led by Hans von Tilburg of NOAA, have worked elsewhere around the islands looking at Oahu's various sites, but also in particular focusing at Kaneohe, where most recently their work 
has included documenting and better understanding some of the seaplanes that were sunk at Kaneohe in that first attack uh, that took out that, that sea base. Another aspect has been moving off of Pearl Harbor and into deeper water. As part of the attack, Japan sent a series of larger fleet submarines to fan out near the entrance of Pearl Harbor to catch anybody that might try to get away. But also five of these had been selected to carry small two-man midget submarines known as Kohayoteki. These craft had been designed before the war and were just in the process of being tested to be launched off of seaplane tenders that were now going to be turned into essentially submarine carriers. 36 of these battery-powered craft, which could get up to 21 knots, armed with only two powerful torpedoes, were to be launched in the middle of an all-out sea battle and mix it up in a way that would leave everybody confused except for these brave young pilots in their midget submarines coming in and striking at the enemy, seemingly unseen and moving too fast, then to come back on board the tender, be rearmed and go again. That type of battle never happened because the submariners who were training uh, on these craft wanted in on the Pearl Harbor attack, and they begged the, the Navy for an opportunity. Admiral Yamamoto did not want to have this happen, but ultimately listened and allowed this to take place, particularly after the pleas of Kiyoshi Inagaki, who had led the team. These are very difficult craft to manage and to operate. And while everyone feared that these guys would not come back or that they might give away the attack in advance, uh, they were allowed to proceed. Both fears were basically realized. When launched by their, their successive larger fleet boats, these five Kohayoteki or midget submarines moved off and headed towards Pearl Harbor. One of the first to be encountered was seen by a PBY Catalina flown by William Tanner. He radioed it in and the Harbor Patrol sub destroyer closest, the veteran World War I craft USS Ward, went out to, visit, to take a look but did not see anything. Not long after that, a second submarine was seen following the USS Condor in. Ward again came into position, spotted the submarine. Now, you might ask, why would it immediately fire? Because the operating rules in a time of war warning, and everybody felt that something was coming, was that any submarine coming into this defensive zone outside Pearl Harbor had to run on the surface and clearly identify itself. This submarine was not and indeed its tiny little conning tower was bopping up and down the waves, suggesting its commander was having a hard time keeping it trim or level. Ward's crew were all reservists who had just come into the Navy. That reserve status notwithstanding, these guys were good shots. The first shot from the deck gun missed, but the second shot nailed the submarine directly through its conning tower. With that, Ward's crew launched depth charges. The submarine bucked out of the water and sank. The United States had just successfully fired the first shot in anger of the Pacific War, though at this stage, nobody knew war was about to come. Commander William Atterbridge of the ward sent a signal to shore indicating that they had just encountered and fired on a sub in the defensive zone and then changed it to that they had fired and seen, fired on and sunk a submarine. It took that message a while to work its way through the chain and when it was finally seen and to meaning, it had literally been handed to the Admiral at the moment that the first planes appeared over Pearl Harbor. So it was in some ways an opportunity missed, a lesson that would be learned. But what this also says is that despite the title of a well-known book at dawn we slept, not everybody was asleep. And indeed the men of the ward, whose word would be questioned for years afterwards as to what they'd really seen and shot at, were on the job and served to the, in the best traditions of the Navy. As we now know, one of those submarines actually did make it into Pearl Harbor. And my sense is, my belief is that this was Kiyoshi Inagaki's sub. He was the leader of the team he had trained the most, had been the initial trial pilot. And his submarine, which made it in to Pearl Harbor, was able to surface during the attack, fire its two torpedoes, which missed, before being rammed by the destroyer USS Monaghan and sinking as likely Inagaki set off its self-destruct charge and blew himself and his crew member into bits and shattered the sub. 
The submarine was ultimately raised after the attack and this map was taken from it. And what it depicts was at the time seen as evidence that perhaps the Japanese had reconnoitered the harbor. But what it is, is it shows the early morning movements of Inagaki's sub as he circumnavigated Ford Island, taking a careful look at everything before settling in for the aerial assault to commence. This is his submarine, which when raised still had his body as well as that of his crew member on board. Naval intelligence went in and recovered the map and other items, which some of which remained classified. And then the submarine was taken and buried on the base. Contrary to common myth, the body of Inagaki and his crew member were both interred and after the war were returned to Japan. Inagaki's lieutenant's insignia from his uniform was also returned and today is on display at Yasukune, which is the Japanese shrine and museum to their war dead. Other midget submarines were supposedly spotted and fired at, but the one that was to make the biggest splash in its own way was one that did not make it into Pearl Harbor, and that was Ha-19. This craft launched at the very end and commanded by Kazuo Sakamaki, failed to make the entrance to the harbor, damaged by having hit the coral reef, unable to fire its torpedoes, batteries leaking, Sakamaki and, Kyo and his, um, his crew member passed out and came to on the early morning of December 8th with the sub rocking in the surf on the opposite side of the island. Sakamaki's crew member did not make it, but Sakamaki did and found on the sand by Sergeant David Akui, became America's first prisoner of war. The submarine was taken apart and studied and then brought back to the United States at Mare Island Shipyard in Vallejo, California. It was reassembled and toured 2000 American cities selling war bonds as part of uh, the effort to not only remember, but also to avenge Pearl Harbor. Subsequently, the other submarines which had remained missing were located. As it turns out in 1952, one of the subs was quietly found, cut up and sent out into deeper water. In 1960, another sub completely intact was found on the opposite side of the entrance to Pearl Harbor uh, and to the opening, the channel that came right on in, in Kehi Lagoon, which today has been filled over and is part of the Honolulu Air. This craft was intact, its torpedoes unfired, but nobody inside. Uh, ultimately, accounts of dead Japanese floating in and around the area and a body of one with a sword also being found close to the harbor entrance just after the attack have enabled us to piece together what seemingly happened. And what we now know, contrary to a variety of more later day theories, which have one of these subs in addition to uh, you know, to the Monaghan midget, shall we call it, making it in, and that sub firing torpedoes at Battleship Row and perhaps even striking one of the battleships, we now know not to be true. A theory that perhaps the sub had stayed behind and in the east block of Pearl Harbor had radioed su successful attack, we also don't believe is true. Just based on the disposition of the subs out of the five launched, we know exactly what happened to Sakamaki's. We know what happened to the one fired on and sunk by the ward. We knew what happened as well with, uh, with the sub sunk by Monaghan, which of course has our, our lieutenant in it. And then we know this Kehi Lagoon sub, and then subsequently, thanks to classified paperwork, able to determine that in 1950-51, the other submarine was found, both of them positioned just outside the entrance to Pearl Harbor. These craft were ill-suited for the job. They were thrown into the maw of war because of their eager young crews who were ill-trained to take these subs into a task that they'd never been designed for. That Inagaki made it into Pearl Harbor is a testament not only to his willpower, but also the higher level of training and the fact that he was the most experienced of them all. What is unfortunate is that coming out of this, the Japanese decided to make these five midget submarines heroic craft and all of the nine dead, minus the still alive and embarrassing Sakamaki as POW number one, were revered as hero gods and Japanese propaganda credited them with sinking a battleship and with the final message coming from one of them proof that perhaps even they'd sunk the Arizona. 
This, of course, angered the pilots who had been there and who had actually sunk the Arizona, as well as the others. But the propaganda was needed. And in the name of these hero gods in Pearl Harbor, these subs were deployed elsewhere into other campaigns with disastrous effects for their crews, with little to say in regard to their contributions to the war effort. Ultimately, what Japan chose to do was to modify these types of craft into human torpedoes, which simply with one man on board could be steered into an enemy ship to sink. The midget submarines that were in deeper water, both the ward as well as potentially one other, were the subject of a number of searches. In the 1990s, Terry Kirby and the team from the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory in their Pisces submersibles were able to find one sub in three pieces. This initially was thought to perhaps have been a post-war capture that had been dumped. Ultimately, it was suggested that this had been the submarine that had survived the attack and had been last seen and potentially scuttled by its crew in the, in the West Lock. But what we now know is a submarine that actually was found raised, cut up, and then dumped in deeper water in more or less a straight line off of where it had been found by the number one hand buoy at the Pearl Harbor entrance opposite the other sub, which would end up at Kehi Lagoon. And this submarine may very well have been one spotted by ships trying to leave Pearl Harbor and fired on. Both of its torpedoes are missing. Kirby and team also discovered the sub sunk by the ward after a number of surveys and systematic dives, usually testing the systems. And here in a thousand feet of water, you see that first shot victim of the war sitting intact on the seabed. And here it is as found. The conning tower still in place, the periscope up, and there the impact point. That is the wound. That is the first shot fired in anger in the Pacific. The wounds of war, of course, exist not only on the ships that are scarred and battered, whose archaeological legacy we've explored. But they also remain there for those who lived with their own injuries, as well as families for whom no one would ever come home. Names known and others not known. Recent work, particularly by the Defense POW and Counting Command, has been able with the laboratory and Pearl Harbor and elsewhere, identify with modern DNA techniques a number of the unknowns who have been disinterred, in some cases from coffins with several dead, and their identities learned. And up until very recently, just within the last few days, we've been seeing reinterments. This has helped bring closure to a number of families. And again, for, for all of us, a reminder that even 80 years on, families still care and would continue to care for decades to come. Ultimately, for any and all of us who have worked out there at Pearl Harbor or on these other ships of war, both at Pearl and Oahu, but elsewhere around the Pacific and in the Atlantic, are reminded that ultimately, while we study history and we look at the physical remains of it, what we're really focusing on is the story of people. People whose legacy to us is measured not only by the wreckage that we see, but also by those who survived that day and whose stories have been passed on to subsequent generations. Here at the bottom, you see a very young Don Stratton after his wounds had healed and an older Don as many of us got to know him in the many years he came back for Pearl Harbor remembrances and, uh, and for reunions. What had also happened in all those years, having been both the 50th and the 75th, was seeing that the veterans were joined by the Japanese ultimately. And at the 50th anniversary, despite some trepidation and some anger on both sides, a number of these old men came to understand that they'd all been young, serving their countries, and that many of their friends, forever locked away in time and not forgotten, but just the same, not there, remained in ste rusting steel coffins. With that, I saw these guys begin to talk, share experiences, and hug each other. And that was a powerful moment, because if there's anything that ever gives you hope, particularly in the face of ongoing strife, disagreement, discord, however you wish to, to phrase it, the common humanity that we all share ultimately, perhaps is our best hope for survival of the human species. 
ultimately for me, it is these people. It is those who have been there and have come back, those who have chosen to be interred with their shipmates. And through the years, the Park Service has been able, working with the Navy, to inter veterans who wish to be with their, seamen, their shipmates for eternity. And in that, I want to close by just briefly offering a, a story of as the 80th anniversary was approaching and as the nation was in the midst of the early stages of the pandemic, the decision that I was able to make with some friends to remind us all, not only of the events of December 7th, but also of something key and essential to be reminded of. And that is not only the power of the human spirit, but also how in the dark moments of this attack and afterwards, a United States seemingly humbled, a United States seemingly licked by the Japanese with all of this damage and all of this, all of these dead did not simply fold, did not pause for a moment, but got up off of the mat as we've seen and went back with American resilience, if not stubbornness, to fight this war through to the end and to win. And in the aftermath of that war, to extend the hand of friendship to its former foes and help them rebuild. One of the ships that speaks to that was the battleship Nevada, which after Arizona also came under attack on that morning, was torpedoed, hit by dive bombers and on fire, was fortunate enough to have some of its junior officers on board and one boiler fired up. They managed to get Nevada underway and they decided, as they said, to just get the hell out of there. And as they moved past the burning and devastated fleet on Battleship Row, there arose a cheer from many on shore who saw this ship going against all odds with a hole in the side like a barn door, one guy said, but just the same, the Navy doing what it did getting up and fighting, moving out. Now, the Japanese concentrated everything they had on trying to sink Nevada. More bombs hit, and ultimately the ship was beached before it could sink in the channel. And there it was ultimately raised and repaired and went on to fight in two theaters of war, shelling the Germans at D-Day and also shelling the Japanese at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Nevada gained a reputation as a ship that would not die in large measure because not only of what had happened to Pearl Harbor, but because it had also been hit by German shell fire at Normandy, it had been hit by Japanese shell fire, and it had been struck by a kamikaze. And just the same, even with loss of life, the battleship and its crew persevered. Nevada really did exemplify the best of us to many through these years. And so with that, the ultimate fate of Nevada had always been something that had nibbled at a number of us. Nevada, as the oldest battleship left in the Navy, was one of a group selected to be used in the atomic bomb tests in 1946, painted international orange, the same color as the Golden Gate Bridge. It was moored in the center of a target array of close to 100 ships, and the bomb was to be dropped on it. The bomb missed, scorched and lightly damaged Nevada. The second bomb set off underwater, also lightly damaged Nevada, but sank other ships. But Nevada while still intact and not dead, had been hopelessly irradiated. Too radioactive to board, it was towed back to Pearl Harbor and in 1948 was towed out to sea to be sunk in a test exercise and to experiment with some new weapons. They thought it would be a simple task, but it took five days for the Navy to sink Nevada. They shelled Nevada, they dropped bombs on Nevada, and finally aircraft came in and hit it with torpedoes. The battleship Iowa also shelled with her 16 inch guns. And at the last moment when Nevada rolled over and finally sank, there wasn't a dry eye there as the Navy then steamed over and from Iowa actually conducted a funeral service for this most famous and important American battleship. I thought of Nevada as COVID hit and having done some research with my colleagues at NOAA, when other friends were in the area, Cognizant of the dwindling number of veterans, like Dr. Charles Sehi, who's still with us here, who had served on Nevada, and as well as people that I'd met, like Captain Don Ross, who had won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions on Nevada that day, and who, along with others, had subsequently been interred 
60 miles out from Pearl Harbor in a large patch of ocean where Nevada had gone down. I felt the time had come to actually find and revisit Nevada. And in that, to remind all of us, even as COVID was making its impact known, that we could get through this because we'd also gotten through other things. So friends from Ocean Infinity with a ship Pacific instructor were on their way back into Pearl Harbor to drop off one crew and load another with COVID restrictions. But they had satellite connection and they also had a fleet of advanced robotic vehicles that on their own can go down and survey in the depths of the ocean, in this case, three miles down. We'd drawn a box based on the coordinates given by various US Navy ships of about 100 square miles. And in a matter of hours, these robots dropped to the bottom, systematically surveyed to very high degree of accuracy, that 100 square miles, and came back with a powerful sonar image of the overturned hull of Nevada, damaged and scarred with a huge crater where it had struck the bottom with all of its weight after having sunk in 1948. And with that, a robotic vehicle was dropped. And as we followed from shore in a completely socially distanced manner with COVID protocols, with the ship locked down and with our team locked down in our own space thousands of miles away, we conducted a series of dives that for the first time revealed Nevada sitting on the seabed from its bow torn away to its stern still painted and marked for the tests of the atomic bomb to one of those rare moments when a shipwreck on the bottom actually gives you its name. In this case, what you can see is the scratched designation of 36 for this battleship or number BB-36, as well as other spaces and compartments like this handling room for a five inch 38, 38 caliber gun. All of this from both the overturned hull to all of the pieces of Nevada that had come off gave us a yet another insight, another archeological legacy, if you will, of Pearl Harbor, but also a reminder that even after all of that, this is what Nevada looks like now. This ship is not completely dead. It is the habitat for marine organisms, but it also is a powerful museum that now, thanks to modern technology, can be accessed well offshore and from three miles down to tell its story and to remind us all. And just a few days ago, John Galloway of Nevada, a staunch friend of this battleship and its community with the US Coast Guard, dropped a wreath from a helicopter at the exact coordinates where we had pinpointed Nevada. And this went to the bottom to join with the rest of the wreckage as a reminder that on this 80th anniversary of a moment in which Nevada first gained the national stage, we remember her. Indeed, we remember all of those people. We remember all of these ships and remember that day, not only because of the memorial, not only because of the archeological legacy, but because of the proud stories of those who served, of their families and of the living legacy that they have passed to us. No matter how tough it seems, no matter how the stakes are aligned against you or for you, Ultimately, what that great generation showed us, and we still have that greatness within us today as a people, not only Americans, but all of us, it's innately human, to get up off that mat, to get out there, and to keep going. That's the true legacy, not only of Pearl Harbor, but of all who have gone before us, who have struggled and strove, and maybe not always survived, but carried us forward. I feel positive about our future because I study our past. Thank you. I wanna thank you for that inspiring talk. We learned so very much about it and you ended on a note of resilience and that the future can be ours. So that's also a very important message. Um, before I get to the questions, I wanna say something a little differently. And that is that the previous year in the fall, the club had a theme, E Pluribus Unum, which speaks to the American population. And I was sent one of the questions, I'm not asking you that, uh, I may later, is about the Hickam base. And in her 
Hawaii. The Hickam base happens to be near the international airport that's named for Senator Inouye. And he was a Japanese who fought in Italy and lost his arm. So one of the lessons of archaeology is that we build bridges, we find our shared humanity, and we go on from there. So this was a very powerful talk um, in all ways. Bravo, and I thank you so much for it. For those who have put their questions into Q&A, that's not how we handle it at the club. Please rewrite it into chat because we're going to go to as many questions as we can while we still have time. There are two that I want to ask from the committee. Um, and I'll tell you that I'm eliminating mine so we can get to more of those under chat from our audience. Uh, it is well known that the USS Arizona is still leaking fuel into Pearl Harbor on a daily basis, threatening the environment. Um, what is the Navy doing or any agencies about this? The oil coming from Pearl Harbor, something that we've all contended with for years. I haven't made a dive on Arizona where I haven't come up with oil on me. That being said, the amount of oil that is leaking from Arizona, well, visible, is actually small compared to other leaks. At this stage, it's been monitored for decades. And I can tell you from having lain on the deck of Arizona and watched that bubble of oil come up from a hatch out of the darkness, a little bubble comes up about every six seconds, drop at a time, and spreads out and sheens on the water. Some people have asked that that not be dealt with because in many ways it's as if these are the tears being shed or that Arizona still bleeds in their mind. Um, that's a very powerful sentiment. Ultimately, all of the assessment that we've done has shown that much of the oil as it is down there remains trapped. Some of it is changing over time and becoming more sludge-like as best as we can tell. And ongoing structural assessment of Arizona suggests that it will be intact and hold that oil for well over another century. To try to get into it and move through the damage and through the sediment and the rest to try to get the oil out would potentially disturb a great deal more oil and lead to a catastrophic release if that much oil is actually trapped down there. And as well, there's also been the question of how appropriate is that given that the ship is a tomb. So there's no direct answer in terms of action to be taken other than to let you know that this has been a subject of ongoing study and concern by both the Navy and by the National Park Service's stewards, and they have regularly continued the focus on that uh, to see just what will ultimately happen. Um, there are approximately 30,000 shipwrecks in American waters. As part of a long-standing effort asked by Congress, NOAA uh, worked to determine which of those ships, most of them World War II, posed a pollution threat, and ultimately, came up with a list of 89 vessels which do pose a potential threat. Since then, ongoing work carefully, slowly, systematically has gone to physically inspect those. I led a couple of those missions and we found that there was not a concern in a couple of cases because all the oil had actually been released in World War II. But most recently, two of these um, World War II wrecks have had their oil remediated and removed through a, an oil spill contingency fund from the Coast Guard by professionals. And just two weeks ago, my colleague, Dr. Mike Brennan, who works with me, uh, relocated with NOAA and did a dive on the deep water wreck of the Bloody Marsh, which thousands of feet down <laughs> still leaks oil. It's visible um, by satellite in space. Um, and that will likely lead to another mission to see just what's happening there. Thank you. Um, another question, and this can is from uh, Lynn, who's my co-chair. And she was inquiring about the ashes of Lauren Bruner, who may be the last person to be placed inside of the Arizona. And will there be a special ceremony? At the same time, if I may, um, we had at least two questions about Doris Miller. 
Yes. Also, so my question also relates to women involved. And so we'll start with um, Mr. Bruner's ashes. Yes, ultimately, um, if the wish is to be interred in Arizona, there will there's always a, a respectful, careful sem- ceremony in which the divers take those remains and place them inside the well of the number four turret, which is where they all go. I participated in one of those uh, very early in my career, back before these ceremonies happened and the widow came and actually not knowing who to ask or what to do, dropped his urn off the side of the memorial. Mm -hmm. I had to reach down into the armor belt and get him out of there. And that, at that point, that's when the decision was made by the Park Service working with the Navy to start putting these guys back in there to join their shipmates. Um, so yes, no, I mean, uh, the ceremonies are powerful and moving and the image I showed uh, is of a widow receiving the flag after one of those ceremonies on Arizona. Dory Miller is an African-American mess steward who joined the Navy at a time of segregation and when blacks were basically not allowed to fight. Um, Seaman Miller exemplified the best mm-hmm. dead fight. His captain was mortally wounded. He dragged Captain Benyon out of the way and then grabbed a machine gun and fought back in his credit. He was striking and probably downing a Japanese aircraft. For this, he received the Navy Cross. Um, he went on to serve and to fight. He was lost in 1943. When the Japanese submarine sank the carrier, he was on the USS Liscombe Bay off of Meccan or, or Macon Island. And uh, he now sleeps miles deep in the wreckage of Liscombe Bay along with his shipmates. The next aircraft carrier in the Gerald Ford class that will be coming off the ways will be christened as the USS Doris Miller. Very good. Interesting. Incidentally, to our audience, so many people want to hear this lecture again. It will be available on the club's YouTube channel, as are all our virtual programs. However, I'm delighted to announce that Doug Tilden, who you know well, um, has granted me the use of some of the educational initiative funds so that all of our live programs will also be on the club's YouTube channel. So you'll be able to be, really have your viewpoint about archeology span expanded very soon, which is, now there've been a couple of questions about radar and knowledge. Did we, ha- what sort of knowledge did we have that their attack was imminent? And do you feel from what you've seen that the government may have suppressed this? Or is this one of those conspiracy theories, which we don't want to get into? I don't think there was any conspiracy. Radar was in its infancy. It had been used. The British had used it. And the United States, the military was testing it and installing it. And it would play a very significant role in the war. At upon a point, this mobile installation had been installed and it was there that Lockhart and Elliot were, um, were watching. These sessions to practice and to learn um, were very different than the kinds of 24 seven surveillance that we would now see. And I think oftentimes we look back into the past and assume, particularly with an emerging technology, that they're gonna approach it the same, they would approach it the same way we would today. These guys, did their job and were doing their job. And it was only because they were keen and wanted to run it a little bit longer and see what they could that they saw this blip. What Mm -hmm. they were actually seeing was the inbound wave. They had no means of knowing that there was no intel that would show that. And indeed, um, while there was a war warning, the sense was that uh, they weren't expecting a strike from the sea like that. Knowing the Japanese, also understanding, you know, Japanese military history, it was thought that some type of a surprise attack might come, but that it might come closer to Japan, perhaps in the Philippines, which was also attacked at the same time as Pearl. Uh, But um, they called Lieutenant Taylor, they they called the Lieutenant, um, and uh, I interviewed these guys for the Mm -hmm. 50th anniversary when we were out there and had them with their lieutenant and some of the others for the first time since the war. Uh, it was somewhat contentious because there was some, still some discussion over 
an opportunity missed. Though I think in all fairness to these guys, they did their jobs, all of them. Uh, there was a flight of B-17s coming in from Hamilton Field in California. It was ex- They were expected. That's what it was thought to be. Mm-hmm. It anticipated the, the, the tactical brilliance of the Japanese in doing what they did. To that, by the way, I just want to point out that um, it was tactically a brilliant move by the Japanese to do what they did as a surprise attack. It was a strategic blunder of epic proportions. Yamamoto never said, I fear we've awoken a sleeping giant building with a terrible resolve, but he knew full well what was going to happen. And he was right. Um, What he perhaps sensed, but I think many people didn't, particularly in the Japanese government, was just how this would fill us with a terrible resolve. Uh, The Japanese in one morning completely swept aside all belief by Americans that we should stay out of the global war. And we came in with a vengeance. Thank you. Um, There were some aircraft carriers that left Hawaii the day before Pearl Harbor. Yes, the, the Enterprise in particular being one. And those carriers had really been what the Japanese wanted to get. They had already begun to see, as others had presciently seen in our military, and the British had seen, that aircraft carriers were going to be the wave of the future. The battleship's day had come and passed, and indeed all of the battleships damaged at Pearl Harbor, when they went back into service, basically became floating gun platforms for shelling the shore, as we saw with the example of the Nevada. The carriers were what carried the war forward, along with those submarines which swept the, she- the seas clean of Japanese shipping and then all who, in, who invaded and took those islands and fought on land, sea and air to hold those islands and to begin that campaign of moving progressively toward Japan and its ultimate fall again uh, in that case with air power with islands like Iwo Jima and others mm-hmm. Tinian being uh, those aircraft carriers in the sea of large enough size to conduct the firebombing raids and ultimately the dropping of the two atomic bombs. I'm not going to ask you of the origin of Star Trek Enterprise's name, but we do have questions about how a battleship's named. You just mentioned one. Are they named? Do the states all get a battleship named for it? In the past, the, the, tra- general- was, the tradition was to name the battleships, capital ships like that after states. The naming of ships by the Navy had changed over time, but battleships is the largest capital vessels were named for states. And so, you know, there at Pearl Harbor, you had the Tennessee, the Maryland, the California, the Mm -hmm. Nevada, Arizona, and so on. Um, These days, the largest capital ships that carry states' names are submarines. And so the current USS Nevada is a submarine. Mm -hmm. While I'm at it, I, I choked up for a second when I was talking about the two pilots that had gotten up and had done so well. That's Kenneth Taylor and George Welch. Uh, just if I'm naming names, those are two names to be mentioned. Sorry for choking up there for a second. And by the time I came from recovering from a dry throat, uh, the moment had passed. But there you have it, Welch and Taylor. Well, since you said something personal, I'm going to ask you a personal question that appeared. Were you ever in the Navy? No, no, um, I'm younger than I seem. Uh, I was too young to uh, join for the Vietnam War and um, also had been injured in my final year in high school. And so um, unable to join the military, I joined the National Park Service and wore that uniform. I, for 20 years, I, was, I served the US government as a civilian. So the Park Service did ship me off to the United States Army, and that's where I learned how to dive at the 6th Army, Presidio, San Francisco, thanks to Master Sergeant Dutch Bowen. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you all, when Jim spoke to the Educational Initiative students at Washington Irving, he spoke about his early interest in archaeology and marine archaeology in particular, which I think was very moving for them. Um, now, the, the memorial is somewhat controversial that there'll be. The Arizona Memorial? 
Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, the ship was there, and as ships came in and out of Pearl during the war. They would all render salutes and honor to the Arizona. Ultimately, I mean, it could not be raised. It was seen as a tomb. There had been some discussion in the past about getting it out of the way and freeing up the berth there at uh, Fort Island and Battleship Road, but ultimately it was left there. The memorial itself, um, designed by Price, mm-hmm is a beautiful and powerful monument. It's also part of the National Historic Landmark. And what it does is it doesn't touch Arizona, as I said, it spans it and covers it. It provides visual access to see the portions of the wreck close in close to the, the concrete deck. And it also has that powerful wall with all of the names of the dead. Um, it's one of the most touching and moving things. Now, memorials and how we respond to them has always been part of our story as people Um, and for Americans as well as for others I think the Arizona Memorial has always everybody I've seen there has always been moved and powerfully Uh, I recently was talking and was reminded of how somebody on one of the boats coming over from the mainland over to the memorial people were talking and chattering and as they got closer to the memorial everybody grew quiet because such is the power of the place. Um, I have not seen children run around. I have not seen people misbehave on that memorial through all of the years. There is something profound about it. And whether, you know, you don't feel connected as somebody younger and more modern to those events, that pa- the power of the place is still there. And anybody that's been to the 9-11 memorial, to the Vietnam veterans or the Korean War memorial, even those of us who remember the Civil War, not personally, but know what it represents, there's something that's just humbling when you stand there at night, particularly in front of Lincoln in that memorial. Um, Memorials are powerful places. There will always be debate about what's appropriate and who designed it and all of that. But the Arizona Memorial, for me, is one of America's most sacred places. I'm going to reply by saying I have not been able to get to the September 11th Memorial. I find it still too upsetting. Um, But for the audience, if you don't know, the archaeology committee was formed. Is my attempt to bring people together as a former teacher of ancient Renaissance art history, I hated the dissensions I heard in New York. And I said, there has to be a way. And archaeology for me has been that method. I'm going to end with one last question. We've stayed way over. I thank the audience who's been able to remain. And everyone, we can't get all the questions, but they'll be under the chat. And if you send your email address, I'm sure that Jim will reply to some of you, if not all of you. So please do that for the questions we haven't answered. But this is a personal question. And it's from the person who said her father was in charge of the instrument shop at Hickam. Do you have any comments with regard to Hickam? Hickam, as well as all of the other Mm -hmm. involved in the attack, all the other places that were hit sometimes gets lost in discussion because everybody focuses on Pearl Harbor and in particular on the horrific events at Battleship Row and the destruction of Arizona. Not for a moment, however, should we forget what happened in all of those places at Hickam, at Eva, at Kaneo and elsewhere. That's why at the start I talked about, as my friend Hans von Tilburg suggests, more about the Battle of Oahu and an understanding that that entire island and all of those forces came under attack, as well as civilians who were killed in the attack, including some killed in downtown Honolulu by anti-aircraft fire that came down, friendly fire that killed some of them. Uh, All of those stories are part of not only history, but of an ongoing narrative. And what has happened in more recent years has been more discussion of that and more documentation and sharing of those stories. So Hickam is a very important place. 
And I will say that having gone to a number of these sites, um, it's one thing to dive on the wrecks. It's another to go and walk up to one of these buildings and still see the pock marks from the strafing on that morning of December 7th, 1940. Mm -hmm. In many ways, that entire landscape over that island is both a reminder, a memorial, and a museum to those events, but also with the community that we have today, another reminder once more of resilience and of the triumph of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you for the person who asked the question, for your father who served at Hickam, and for Jim, for your absolutely splendid lecture. And it allowed our audience to understand more fully what the attack at Pearl Harbor entailed. It was, as always, a pleasure to learn from you. And a reminder regarding our next event, which is going to be held at the National Arts Club on January 25th. It will be an International Archaeology Day event featuring Her Excellency Ambassador Maria Theophili, the permanent representative from Greece to the United Nations. And if you can't get into the club that day, it will be on YouTube subsequently. So you can enjoy it that way. Jim, my thanks so deeply. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.